بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم أخرجني من ظلمات الوهم وأكرمني بنور الفهم اللهم افتح علينا أبواب رحمتك وانشر علينا خزاء علومك برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين الحمد لله بهذا التوفيق to continue our study of Islamic plan for life we talked in the last session about self-building self-knowledge self-purification and the very last thing uh, in that part is about a good technique that we can use and our ulama have very much emphasized on it and especially when it comes to one of them Allama Tabatabai had this as a major aspect of spirituality and that is Muraqaba and we had uh, some lectures in uh, Hose Akhlaq series about this so our ulama say that what we need to do in order to discipline ourselves, train ourselves. Because sometimes maybe some people, when they know that they have to do something, they make decision and they do it. They are very blessed and fortunate. But some of us maybe find it difficult. We are not that determined. So we know that we must do something or not do something, but still we may change later. So they say we need musharata. Musharata means to fix a kind of condition, a kind of making a promise to yourself. That you say, for example, I am very careful to say my prayer on time. And if I don't say my prayer on time, this is going to be my penalty. Or if I say it on time, this is going to be my reward. For example, if I like uh, something, I say, okay, it's conditional upon saying my prayer on time. Or if I don't like something, I think this is the penalty if I don't say my prayer on time. This is called musharata. When your nafs calculates and says, okay, if I don't cooperate, <laughs> I'm going to suffer. Either that pleasure, I don't get it, or that pain, I will get it. It comes from penalty. Then your nafs becomes more obedient and cooperates with you. So musharata is before the time of the action. But then you need muraqaba to monitor and observe yourself during the time. You cannot leave yourself to the chances and then just later see what has happened. Muraqaba is very important. Actually, a mu'min is always monitoring himself or herself. And not just to monitor what you are saying, even monitor the process. So if something is not right, not only you should understand it quickly, but actually you should assess it before saying it so that you can stop it. Muraqaba is not just to have a camera and record every moment and then later assess Muraqaba is more than having a camera fixed on yourself. Muraqaba means to check the process before doing something or saying something. Muraqaba means to keep light on your decisions. And unless you are sure something is right, don't decide to do it or say it. And then Muhasaba. Muhasabatun nafs means now you have to 
question yourself. You have to examine what you have done, what you have said, or what you didn't do, you didn't say. Imam Kazim alayhi salam said, Laysa minna man lam yuhasib nafsahu kulla yawm. It's not one of us who doesn't examine himself, question himself, recant himself every day. So every day, every week, every month, every Laylatul Qad, on different occasions and different periods of time, we have to examine ourselves. Hasibu anfusakum qabla an tuhasabu. Like when you have a business, you should keep your account ready and check it before inspectors come. So these are three things that were about khutsazi or self-building that help us a lot. And our time is very limited, but Alhamdulillah, we have some lectures about this uh, self-assessment and uh, self-monitoring. You can find them, inshallah. The next topic is taqwa, piety or God-fearing or god wariness We need two things, iman and amal salih, faith and righteous deeds. If you manage to have faith and righteous deeds in a consistent way for a considerable period of time, a condition will take form in your heart, which is called taqwa. Taqwa is not one action, one you know, word, one experience. Taqwa is a condition that emerges in your heart when you have had faith and righteous deeds for a considerable period of time. When there is some level of permanence or consistency to the extent that you become immune, you are not masoom. There is a chance that you may, you know, be muttaqi and then you may lose it. You are not masoom. But taqwa is a, like immunity system. People with immunity system, still they may become ill. But easy things, simple things, weak viruses cannot make them ill. But they have to be careful, they have to be alert, they should not take risk. But there is some system of immunity. Muttaqi, a pious person, is given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala light, insight, and courage to make difficult decisions to resist against temptations, to resist against pressures, against, I don't know, bribery, any kind of methods that people may use to make you act as they like, taqwa helps you to protect yourself, to safeguard yourself. So, if we want to define taqwa there are different ways but maybe one way which also is highlighted in the book but actually it's also something that we can find from hadith is that taqwa is to be present where Allah wants you to be present and to be absent where Allah doesn't want you to be present or you can say taqwa is to observe will of God with respect to his commands and prohibitions. If he has told us to do something, we should do them. If he says not to do, we should not do them. This is taqwa. So the bottom line of taqwa is not to fail doing any wajib and not to commit any haram. 
if you don't do some of the mustahabbat or if you do some of makruhat, so if you don't do some of the things which are recommended or you do something which is disliked, uh, still you can be muttaqi. But never take any risk with your taqwa by uh, doing things which are haram or uh, fail to do wajib or things which are problematic shubuhat the things that are not clearly known to be halal or haram you should not take risk and this is vara vara means to be alert and careful by not taking risk by not even going close to haram how can we achieve taqwa few practical and uh, you can say for you te uh, techniques are mentioned in the book of course very briefly because each of these can be discussed in details and uh, you are actually recommended to uh, study uh, Ayatollah Mutahari's uh, lectures on taqwa which are alhamdulillah translated in message of Thaqalain I think we had two essays uh, translate to English a few years ago, available on the website of Message of Thaqalay. Uh, maybe inshallah Brother Mustafa can find them and share with you the link. One method and one way or instruction is to invest on strengthening our determination. Empower your will power increase your willpower asthma asthma is very very important uh, those who had the uh, Islamic belief system before they know that when it was about the characteristics of the prophets we said one major characteristic of the prophet is asthma among all human beings, 124,000 were selected by Allah as prophets. Among 124,313 were selected as Rasul. Among 313 Rasul, five are called Ulul Azm. So this is the select of the select of the select. They are called people of determination. Adam alayhi salam, Allah says, Lam najad lahu azma. We didn't find determination in him. At least when he was in that heaven garden, he didn't have that determination. So he's not ulul azm. But Nuh is ulul azm. 950 years non stop he worked to guide people. Only some 80 people believed in him. He didn't stop. He didn't become despaired or <laughs> depressed. If maybe someone who was not determined was in place of Nu, he would have even committed suicide <laughs> out of depression. Every 12 years, as average, one person accepted Iman and faith. But he didn't stop. This is Ulul Asm. Ibrahim alayhi salam is ulul az, Musa alayhi salam, Isa alayhi salam, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam. So, increase your, um, uh, your willpower, strengthen your willpower. It's very good. Months of Ramadan is a great opportunity, but we can do it throughout the year. Be consistent in your prayer on time. This increases your willpower. I don't know if you have listened to that lecture I had in the Hosea that in my humble understanding the future of the world very much is going to be shaped by those who have determination. In future the success is not a measure of money, a measure of quantity, weapons, no, not that much. It's a matter of determination. It would be battle of determinations. 
who is more determined is going to win. And unfortunately, the way things are evolving are making us more and more, you know, I can say weak, weaker in our determination. We become too dependent, we become too easygoing, too flexible, and maybe sometimes even too liberal. To find some structure, some organization, some commitment, some dedication become rare and rare. People want to be always uh, free and keep always their options open. Don't commit to anything as much as possible. <laughs> you know, sometimes I mention this example. So for example, say, you know, what do you like, for example, for tonight? Maybe they don't say what they like for tonight. Although they love, for example, this food, but they say, no, maybe I change my mind. Why I should, you know, say in advance? <laughs> I will tell you later. What should we do next week? As much as possible. There is a course starting. They don't register. They leave it for the last minute. I'm not saying everyone is, uh, you know, uh, without excuse. But I'm saying this is a trend. Maybe we don't know ourselves what is happening to us. But it seems that we are becoming less and less ready to commit ourselves and therefore we become less and less reliable because people who are always you know ready to go they like as they want and they go as they want how can you rely on them sometimes you know i make this uh, comment of course with some humor i say you know sometimes unfortunately the community because there is no regularity, there is no reliability. People come like flood. <laughs> flood is sometimes coming in the places which suffer from drought. <laughs> Throughout the year, there is no water. But all the water comes in few <laughs> days and then they disappear. Sometimes community centers are empty. Then all of a sudden, few hundreds of people come and then they disappear. So you wonder what to do. Shall we make huge centers so that we can accommodate these people? Shall th but this is not economical. Shall we make a small places, but what we will do with this community when hundreds or thousands of people want to come and there is no space? <laughs> I am not blaming anyone. I'm just saying that we have to open our eyes because sometimes we don't know actually ourselves that these are patterns that are becoming more and more regular in us. So determination, this is what we have to inshallah invest on. And strengthening our faith. And this can happen through a studying, through discussion, through Tafakkur, contemplation, especially about belief in Allah and in the hereafter. Iman, billah wal yawm al akhir. Many times in the Quran, these two come together. And these are key factors. So we have to invest. Number three, love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As much as you can develop love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah said to Musa, Habibni ila khalqi. O Musa, endear me to my people. Not because Allah needs us, because we need him and we need his love. In dua Abu Hamza we say, Alhamdulillah alladhi tahabbaba ilayya wa huwa ghaniyun anni. All praises to Allah who endeared himself to me although he doesn't need me. Sometimes I endear myself to someone because I need that person. But Allah doesn't need us but because for our sake. Like a teacher who endears himself to the student so that he can educate them. A doctor that endears himself to the ill people so that they come to him and take his prescription. Not that the teacher needs the students or the doctor needs 
the patients or ill people. Increasing love for godly people, for awliyaullah, and for people in general, but especially with awliyaullah, righteous people, virtuous people. Love for them make your heart more and more prepared to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and vice versa. The more love you have for Allah, the more you love people. Love is such a, you know, alchemy that when it comes to heart, a genuine love, even love of a mother for a child, love of a child for mother, love of husband and wife for each other, if it's a genuine love, it makes your heart prepared for love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Love for the poor people, love for the environment, any love, if it is genuine, has this characteristic that it is free from ego, is free from selfishness. So prepare your heart to become a container for love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and vice versa. Of course, these loves have different degrees, different significance, but any genuine love is appreciated. And number five, prayer. If we want taqwa, we need to pray. We need to ask Allah for help. And this is why in our du'as, you see, we ask Allah for help. Not to put responsibility on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and think that you have no responsibility. Oh, Allah, help me with this, help me with this, and I don't, or don't, I don't do anything. No. We do our best, but we know that our success needs His support. Even my own decisions in order to remain firm I need his support I do my best but I need his support and this is why du'as of Ahlul Bayt are du'as of people that they were very very active and very serious and committed and determined but the most humble people before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they were not du'as of people who were not doing anything people of for example laziness na'uzubillah no but at the same time very very humble because they know all the success all the tawfiq comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we have then some discussion about outcomes of taqwa I say it very quickly because we want to uh, also answer some questions one is with taqwa, Allah gives you distinction, ability to discern. Furqan. In tattaqullah yaj'al lakum furqana. If you have God wariness, Allah will give you something by which you can discern, you can understand what is right, what is wrong. You know, we many times make mistakes when things become mixed up when things become mixed up when things are you know uh, rushed and you don't have clarity you make mistake to be clear and distinct are very much needed and taqwa helps you by giving furqan that helps you to make things in their own order, right order, to separate them, to distinguish and make proper decision. Another thing is that taqwa enables us to have some knowledge that are not available to ordinary people. Allah says in the Quran, Ittaqullah wa yu'allamkumullah. Have taqwa and Allah is going to teach you. This teaching is this additional knowledge that Allah gives to muttaqin. Number three, love of Allah is for muttaqin. فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ الْمُتَّقِينَ Allah loves the people who are muttaqin. Number four, Allah accepts the deeds of muttaqin. إِنَّمَا يَتَقَبَّلُ اللَّهُ مِنَ الْمُتَّقِينَ Allah only would accept from the pious people. 
taqwa is a condition for acceptance of a'mal. You may remember a story of that person that in the time of Imam Sadiq alayhi salam stole two fruits and two pieces of bread and then gave it to a poor person and when Imam asked him why you do this you know he said haven't you read the Quran Quran says if you do something bad you will be punished only equal and proportional to that but if you bring something good you will be rewarded ten times more so I stole four items but I will give get reward of 40 hasana when I gave it to someone else so 40 minus 4 means 36 <laughs> so he thought he has done 36 hasana Imam alayhi salam said you didn't read the Quran properly Allah says innama yataqabbalullah min al-muttaqeen Allah would only accept from muttaqeen you didn't get any hasana registered and actually by giving haram to someone else you did more sayyah if you had just stolen this is for sayyah but you give it to a poor pe person who doesn't know and you are feeding him from haram this is extra so innama yataqabbalullah min al-muttaqeen Allah would accept from the pious people so what I do in different areas of life affect acceptability of my salat, my fasting, my charity. And also taqwa helps us to have a way out from difficulties and problems. In Surah Talaq Allah says, وَمَنْ يَتَّقِ اللَّهِ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجَ Whoever has taqwa Allah would give him a way out. Allah would give him sustenance from where he doesn't expect. Whoever puts his trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah would be sufficient. So these are outcomes of taqwa. And then signs of taqwa. One sign of taqwa is that you are able to suppress your anger. You don't let your anger to take you to the wrong direction. Your anger make you do things that later you regret. Taqwa would also make you able to forgive people because you want to be forgiven. Taqwa helps you to overcome temptations and resist again against your lust and whims. Taqwa makes you have good temper and to be able to be kind to other people and especially to be helping them in the time of their needs or poverty. Taqwa brings balance to our actions. We don't go to extremes and Taqwa makes us repent quickly if God forbids we make some mistake and not to insist on our mistakes and sins so alhamdulillah we finished discussion about taqwa and inshallah in the next session we are talking about remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alhamdulillah rabbil alamin Allahumma salli ala Thank you very much, Shaykhna, for an excellent Allah. session once again. Um, inshallah, we have a question that was asked last week and um, we didn't get around, we didn't get a chance to ask it. It is linked to the Hadith class, but also linked to racism and prejudice, which is discussed later in this book. Um, so it mentions that there are some Hadiths that say, for example, you should trade with Africans or not marry with Kurds. Um, these examples have been given. Isn't this racism and against the teachings of the Holy Quran? Uh, as we said, our ulama are not accepting any hadith. First, we have to verify the chain of narrators. And then, after that, we have to check them against the Quran 
even if a hadith is coming from a reliable source, but it's against the Quran, Ahlul Bayt say throw it at the wall. Sometimes hadith were said in the times of taqiyya, sometimes hadith are misunderstood. So it's not easy to make sure that hadith is authentic and to make sure that we understand the hadith properly and to make sure that this was not said in a particular context. As far as Islam is concerned, there is no place for racism. It's very clear. There is no place for discrimination. But it is possible that, for example, people are recommended to marry to the people who are closer to their culture or not to marry to people that they don't know about them, they don't know their language. And this can change over time. Nowadays, for example, people are very much mixed. They understand each other or they have common language. But uh, still, even today, it might be advisable to say that marry with the people that are closer to your culture, to your language, to your religion or to your mazhab denomination. For example, we can marry to non-Shia Muslims. But do we advise people to marry non-Shia Muslims? There is no problem at all. But it can create problems, you know. Maybe even for that person is not good, you know. It's not that, for example, because we are Shia saying this, even if we were Sunni, maybe we would have said the same thing, that you must be alert about all the complications of marriage. Especially sometimes, you know, if two Shia marry and have problem, uh, still they can keep it inside the community. But for example, suppose a Shia marries to a Sunni and then they have problem, then becomes problem between two communities. Sunni Shia of the city fight each other because of these uh, two individuals. So, uh, no place for racism or discrimination, but cultural similarity or differences are also to be observed. Situation of the time, context, all these things are to be concerned, but no racism. Excellent. Thank you so much. Sheikh. You're welcome. Um, there was a question again asked last week, again this week. Um, I would just remind everyone to try to keep questions related to the two subjects. Uh, inshallah, we'll try our best to do as much as we can. Um, it says, please, can you explain the difference between practical akhlaq and practical irfan? Is one of them a prerequisite to the other? Practical akhlaq and practical irfan are very close to each other. And in the course on introduction to Islamic mysticism, Actually, Ayatollah Mutahari explained this, that theoretical irfan is close to philosophy, but practical irfan is very close to akhlaq. Uh, actually, if you remember, or some of you who had studied self-development, we said there is one current in akhlaq, which is mystical akhlaq. Some books of akhlaq are mystical. Uh, so there is close connection or you can say at least some akhlaqi books and uh, scholars, their approach is very much practical irfan. But some, no, they, for example, just to give you an example, uh, some uh, scholars of akhlaq, they are not looking at akhlaq as a gradual process, as you know, it's certain hierarchy of stations. So this is not mystical approach, because mystical approach is gradual and is hierarchical. Mystical approach uh, emphasizes on having a mentor, uh, and mystical approach emphasizes on uh, freeing your heart from anything other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Other akhlaqi approach are also there. They may end up with this, but they may not you know, start with uh, this process of graduality. So, there are similarities, but you can have more diverse approaches to akhlaq than practical irfan. 
Excellent. Thank you very much. Sheikh. You're welcome. I think we are just hitting Salat time here in London, so it seems a good place for us to leave the session and inshallah we look forward to next week's session. There is a request after today's session for Sheikh and everybody to please recite a Surah Fatiha for a Marhum who passed away in Canada today, for him and for all of our Marhumin. Inshallah we can do that um, as soon as today's session is over. And I'm not sure Sheikh, do you have any last uh, words you would like to say for today? No, we just uh, remember this Marhum and all Marhumin and also pray for all people who are ill and uh, unfortunately we have uh, people who are ill here and also uh, Sayyid Jawad Shahrestani in Qom, Vakil of Ayatollah Sistani, he is also ill. So we pray for all the ill people also to have inshallah quick shafa. Yeah. Thank you very much, Sheikh, and everybody who attended. Thank you. May Allah bless you. We look forward to the session next Wednesday. Inshallah. Thank you very much. And uh, maybe also uh, those who have not got the Islamic plan for life, contact the admin because Alhamdulillah the books have arrived. So you can contact the admin to arrange your copy, inshallah. Yes. Al-Tamasada. <laughs>